Real quickly, this is the second recording where I'm going through the CCW manuals, part one, two, and the panel view 800. And I'm showing a lot more than I normally show, so these don't go very fast. Just a warning. There's another set of videos on the YouTube channel in the playlist for CCW. Watch those instead. Again, let's continue. Remember, I had created a project only so I could open it up and explain to you why you might want to pick 13 instead of 20. I'm doing this in 20. It's what I got on my computer. I can't have both revision levels. You should be doing this in 13. At some point, they'll get 20 straightened out. But for right now, you're best off with 13. So I created a project. However, I'll just create a brand new one. I'll do it all over again. See, I have nothing here. So it's new, open, existing, or you can even discover. I'm not going to explore that right now. I'm just going to create a new one because that's what you're going to do. Now it comes up project one. And let me explain. Every time you create a project, if you accept the name, next time you're going to get project two, then project three, and so on. I give them names right off the bat because project seven wouldn't mean anything to me. I, that far down the trail, I wouldn't know what it meant. So I'll just pick um, manual part one. And I'm going to make this underscore two just to show that it was the second recording. When I save these projects, keep in mind that eventually I hope to take all the files that I saved as I go along through projects in the manual and make the finished code available for instructors to use in their class. So we'll have an instructor's guide. In some classes, it's easier to have the students just upload a file and then edit it or make changes or analyze it rather than starting from scratch. But we're going from scratch. So I'm going to create, click on create. First thing I'm going to do is pick a controller. Remember, I explained to you that the E version is what you use in 20. The non-E version you use in 13. Now, I pick, happen to have a Micro 820 QBB, 20 QBB. That means 20 input. If I look at my version, even though I'm running 20 and before I was running 13, 13, it supports this, but in 12. So this is not version 13. The firmware in this bad boy is 12. You're probably doing the project with version 13, but as long as when you open it up, it shows something less, numbers less than the version that you have. If you have 12, you're good. If you have 13, you're good. If you have 20, you're good. But if you have 11, you have to pick 11 or lower, okay? And I notice this new thing that says active. I assume that that means that it's an active controller and not falling into the retired version. So I select that, add the project. The geeks in the background, they do a little thinking. They're putting it together for us. And there we have our project. Now, my particular LC20 happens to have an analog module plugged into it, and I don't want to unplug it just to keep it out of this project. So I'm going to go down here to plug in modules. I'm going to right click analog. It's an I and it's done. Now, I'm not going to do anything with the configuration because we're not going to use it, at least not in the current set of manuals. We might to do an analog lab way down the road. So this is your project. and there's no programs. This isn't like 5,000 or even 500 where you automatically get a program with a main routine. Like in 500, you would get a program, and there is only one program in a 500 or Micrologics, and you would get the main routine, and you would have to do everything else yourself. In 5,000, it's, it's similar. If you create a program, it's going to come with a main routine, but you can have multiple programs. This guy is neither 500 or 5,000, so it is very different. So I'm going to go create a program, add, and I can pick any one of these three languages. We're going to stick to ladder diagrams because that's the bulk of the installed base out there. Structured text is good for little math functions and maybe little algorithms for data, and that's it. It's very hard to troubleshoot. So any lengthy programs and structured text are going to be an albatross to whoever has to deal with them. Function block diagrams, 
That's good for process control where you're doing temperature control, mixing, volumes, you know, batching, etc. We're sticking to ladder diagrams. So I'll pick that and voila, I have program one. Now I'm going to leave it program one for now. Later on, I, I might change it to something else. I'm going to go double click on global variables here and you'll see that what I have here are really the variables that you cannot edit. Some of them you can't even change the value. Notice that you could alias them and they have a data type, Boolean, that's a single bit, a unsigned double integer, that's 32 bits, signed integers like a S-I-N-T or a U-I-N-T. -int, uh, if it has a U in front of it, that means that all the bits can be configured for a particular value. So if you use the 32nd bit, that would be bit 31 is the sign, plus and minus, one is minus, zero is plus, then you only have 31 total bits. If it's unsigned, you can represent twice the value of number. Double integer, 32 bits. Time is something you're not gonna see, this data type, in 500 or 5,000. They don't need it. They don't use it. An unsigned integer is a 16-bit integer value. An int would be a 16-bit signed integer. Remember that the most significant bit is the sign of the number. String, let's not discuss that. Single integers, by the way, are 8 bits. Let's see if we've got anything else in here. I don't see anything else to look at. Oh, Word. We'll have to discuss that when we get into the analog, if we do. So um, a little bit more complicated, but remember, we're not using the analog in this project. So those are the variables that are scoped, meaning their vision or their scope, their space is global. That means they're, very, they're available for all the programs that you might put under programs. Notice that says programs, plural. So I could easily add another program and it's program two. You know, I can have a bunch of programs. So I'm going to delete this simply because it just muddies up the waters here. One program. So we looked at the global variables. That's what we're looking at right here. And now let's look at the local variables. And you see there are none unless you create them. Now, pay very close attention here. The local variables can only be read and written to from this program. If I go back here and create another program, now I have two programs and each of them has local variables. Program one and program two can access the global variables. They can read them and write to them. But these local variables can only be, can only interact with this program. And these local variables can only interact with this program. So program one can interact with any global variables and its own local variables. It's like this is a family unit, and this is their backyard, and this is their vegetable patch. They can bring in vegetables, plant here, do whatever. But the neighbor has to stay in their own garden. But both of them can go out and go to the store and access the global variables. So these are global vegetables and groceries. We'll just say vegetables. And these are your backyard. Good way of putting it. I'm going to delete this thing and continue on. One thing I will tell you, once you start putting stuff in your program or your variables, you can't just go delete program. You have to empty it out first. We're not going to discuss any of this other stuff right now. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. That is, it's bad enough what we're going to do without muddying up the waters. So that's a new project. So now I'm going to grab a manual and I'm going to start with the very first project. The first thing we want to do, and again, I say we don't care about this, and we looked at the local variables, we looked at the global variable, and now what we want to do is find this processor and connect to it because we're going to have to download. I'm going to go up and I'm going to hit connect and it'll take a minute to find itself. That was pretty quick. Now, notice you see a lot of things going on here. These are drivers that I have configured for other purposes. I want you to ignore most of this. <laughs> the one in particular that 
is of interest is this 2080 remote LCD. They have a little LCD display that has a USB connector on the front. And then you can connect it by DF1 over to a terminal block right on the processor. Now the LC20 comes with Ethernet and it comes with a serial interface, but it's a terminal block. It's not a connector. So what I did was I wired up that terminal block to the remote LCD. And if I expand here, see there's the 820. You see it's there. See the little circulating there? It's browsing and it finds it. So I could connect with the USB connection into the remote LCD, but I'm not going to instead I'm going to use Ethernet, and it should be in the Ethernet IP, and there it is. See, at 100, 100, 100, 116. Now, my subnet mask, by the way, that Ethernet bridge module, ENBT, this is a Control Logics chassis that just happens to be plugged in right now. That's irrelevant to what we're doing. Close that back up. So you can use either one of these. Now, remember, I have two cables plugged into my LC20. I have the USB plugged into the remote LCD that's hardwired over to a terminal strip on the LC20 processor or controller, if you want to call it that. And then I have an Ethernet cable going through switches over to my the same computer that the USB is plugged into. So I'm going to declare this as the path, okay? Ethernet. I'm going to say, okay. Now look up here. It shows that we have a path between this controller. Okay. This is a message that comes up and it's actually handy because it's saying that the project that's in the controller doesn't match the project that we have on the screen. So rather than lose this learning opportunity, if I say download current project to controller, then it's going to download this totally empty, just created, put nothing in it, program and data files into that controller. But instead, because I can back this up, you know, delete it and start over, I'm going to upload the project in the controller to overwrite the current project content. Okay, and now I'm going to upload it with logical values. I could upload or skip the logical values by just upload or with them. So I'm going to say with them, and this will take a minute. And keep in mind, I have no idea what's in here, if anything. And it may even Ralph on me because it doesn't like firmware levels or something. So this is what I go through when I'm doing things. As long as you got that blue swirly, it's still thinking. By the way, CCW is very slow at upload and download and online editing. Very slow compared to 500 or 5,000. I see here, I'm always going to get in the output screen down here. I'm going to get some details of what I just did. Upload logical values to current project succeeded. See, starting upload and then one succeeded, no failures, nothing skipped. So I'll just close that because I don't want to look at it. Now, I don't know what's here. I'm going to double click on program one and see if there's any, oh, hey, there's some code in there. Now, this is interesting. Looks like I'm doing like a little flashing thing. Notice I got some timers running. And they won't run unless I turn on input zero. So I'll just do that just for granted. And it's not running. And here's why. So you notice what I did. I went from this program. I went back to the Micro 820 dashboard and see I left it in program mode. So I'm going to move this over to run mode. And now I'm going to go back to program one. Anything that you open opens tabs up here. So if you don't want all those tabs open, either don't open them or you know, hit the X here when you're done. Two tabs is not a bother. So see, I turned on input zero, and now the timers are executing, and the lights over on my digital field device simulator, it's a box with six inputs and six outputs, they're flashing on and off. Now, I'm not going to go discuss this. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it, well, it saved it as manual part one underscore two. I really didn't want to do that. So I'm going to say save. Actually, I'm going to, I want to save this with a different name. So I'm going to, I hit save. Then I hit connect, which means I want it's connected. So I want to disconnect. So now it says it's disconnected. Now I can go here 
and save this project as flashing. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to close this project. I see that I kind of misspelled it up there, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to close it and I'm going to open up this one, which it had what we uploaded in there. So all I'm going to do is delete that wrong. Look at my local variables and I'm going to delete all of those timer tags, data types or timer variables that had been created in program one. So if I go to global variables, look down through here, see the only ones in here are the ones that we started with. See down there where it says new, nobody added any variables. So we're back to a clean project. So now I'm going to, now that we're connected with RS links, now I'm going to go back and we're going to start on one of the lab projects. Okay, that's the second segment. Going forward, I'm not going to necessarily put a header and a trailer on each segment. You just get the flow and you just keep looking for the next one and the next one. I'll try to put a label so you know it's one, two, three, four, some kind of sequence. But I'm not going to record a little header and trailer on all of the segments. It's a waste of time. Thank you for watching.